You're listening to the My Simplified Life podcast, and this is episode number 74. Welcome to the My Simplified Life podcast, a place where you will learn that your past and even your present don't define your future. Regardless of what stage of life you're in, I want you to feel inspired and encouraged to pursue your dreams, simplify your life, and start taking action today. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac, and I'm excited to share my stories and life lessons with you while taking you on my own journey. This is my simplified life. Hi, friends, and welcome to another episode. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac. When was the last time you took a business retreat for yourself? I'm not talking about a conference or something with your team. I'm talking about a solo business retreat for a day or two. This is a term that is new to me. So when I was on a Twitter chat recently and saw that Melanie Paget Powers had recently taken one and even did a podcast episode on it, I knew I needed to chat with her and for you all to hear about what she does on these solo retreats. I wanted to learn how we can all plan them for ourselves. Mel is a freelance writer who specializes in working with membership associations and is also the host of the Deliberate Freelancer podcast. You are going to love hearing how you'll be able to create space and time for your own solo business retreat and the questions you should ask yourself during this time. Hi, Melanie. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. I, we are Twitter friends, so we have not met <laughs> outside <laughs> of Twitter and some emails, which I love. And the whole reason that we connected was because you said that you'd gone on a solo retreat. And I want to know more because I think we should all have a solo retreat. <laughs> <laughs> so can you take a moment and introduce yourself, please? Sure. I am Melanie Paget Powers. I'm the owner of Mel Edits. I'm a freelance writer and editor. I live in the Washington, D.C. area. And I'm also host of Deliberate Freelancer, which is a podcast for business owners, freelance business owners, I should say. I love it. And how did you come about this? Were you always a writer, always freelancing, or was there some backstory to it? So I was always that English kid who was always writing short stories. And I worked on the high school newspaper in high school and loved it. And so I went to college for journalism to become a newspaper reporter. And I ended up really loving being a small town newspaper reporter. I'm originally from Indiana. And so I was a small town newspaper reporter in my 20s. And then I moved to the Washington, D.C. area to find a job with better hours and better pay and have a social life outside of my tiny hometown. And so when I moved to D.C., I fell into a job at a membership association and I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what associations are. And I was covering public health, which seems very relevant today. But at the time, I did not know what public health was. But they really enjoyed, they really liked that I had a journalism background. And they wanted a former reporter to, as assistant editor of their monthly newspaper about public health. And so I found out I really liked membership associations. And I quickly explained to people that whatever your job is, there's an association for it. So if you're a teacher, think of the, you know, National Education Association, or if you are a nurse, there's association for emergency room nurses. There's an association for every kind of nurse under the sun. And basically those are the organizations you join and you pay your annual dues to go to the conference and get a magazine and get the weekly or monthly newsletter updates. And they'll advocate for you on Capitol Hill and you can take webinars and get your continuing education. And so I work for members. And so in 2013, I decided to go out on my own. I wasn't quite happy with the job I had at the time. And I thought, well, I'm leaving and I'll just figure it out. So I went out on my own as a freelancer. And that was about seven years ago. And I love it. I work mostly for membership associations, mostly about healthcare. And I do a couple of things outside of those areas. But yeah, I absolutely love being my own boss. That's great that you took what you knew and you just used it to continue on and do it on your own, though. 
Yeah, I always love hearing people's career progressions and how they kind of meander from jo- certain jobs. And yeah, I had no idea. I was, I never wanted to be a freelancer. That was never in the plan. I just continued to work at these jobs and move up a little bit and do things that I loved. And I really love being an editor, a managing editor of magazines and newsletters. And I really like writing. And so I'm able to do all of those things as a freelancer now. It's an artful skill. <laughs> Not everyone can do it. I know. <laughs> no, I know. Editors are a certain breed. And luckily, I did go to college for it. I had a lot of great internships. So I've been able to kind of build my career from there. That's amazing. So let's then get into this solo retreat. What is a solo retreat? <laughs> so I call it a solo business retreat. And I talk a lot about it to freelancers. And honestly, it just came up kind of organically early on in my business because I like to really analyze things and I like to also name things. I think it sticks in your head more. It's more fun. You might be more apt to remember it or do it. So I kind of jokingly in my head decided I was going to take a day completely free of client work to focus on my business because a lot of freelancers don't do that. We just go from day to day in the hustle and continue to do the work and don't take a step back and really think strategically about our business and what we want to do. And so I named it the Solo Business Retreat because at the time I thought it was really funny that you think of business retreats and I'm just one person. And I thought, well, that's a solo business retreat. And I also, at the very first one, I didn't leave my house. I just went to the dining room. And so I just thought that was really funny that I was going to call it a retreat. And I just went to the dining room. <laughs> so In these days, that would be normal. <laughs> I know. I know. I laugh about that now because now I really want to get out of the house. But uh, yeah, so that first time. It's really, as I said, just a way to really step back and look big picture and think long term. Am I doing what I want to do? Are things going well? What can I improve upon? And over time, I've done, I do these, I try to do them once a quarter now. And I really just take a full day completely. The key is you cannot do client work and you can't check email. It's all about you and your business. And so treat it like a day off or from client work and put that out of office message on and take the time to really focus on your business. And then over the years, I've come up with a lot of different things that I analyze during the day that we can talk about as well. Yeah. How do you structure it? I think that looking big picture and some people might go, okay, that's like a blank piece of paper that I sit down with. Where do I even begin? And I will say too, over the years, can't do it now during the pandemic, but I have gone to my local library for the day or half a day to do a retreat. That's been fun. One year I actually did go to a hotel. I went a day early to a conference and was able to spend a whole day in a hotel doing my retreat. So I have made it more of a retreat. Yeah, it was really nice. (laughs) (laughs) So what I do is I actually have an agenda for the day and it's very basic. It's just a couple of bullet points. You don't have to go too hard on your agenda, but it keeps you on task and it helps you to, you know, just like I said, keep on task. But I ask myself a few questions to kind of develop that agenda and figure out what I want to do. So you could ask yourself, what do I want to solve in my business? That could be a focus of a section of the day. It could be the whole day. You can do one big thing that day or you can do a bunch of different things. I say, okay, so where do I want my business to go? Am I happy with my business? What were the best things that happened this past year in my business? And what were the worst things? And how can I do more of the best things? And do I need to get rid of some of the worst things? And those worst things could be you know, particular things that you need to work on. You know, maybe you have imposter syndrome or you got burnout or it could just be bad clients or low rates. It could be all kinds of things. So I really kind of ask myself, what do I want with my business? And then I start to build an agenda from there. I like it. I've heard of people referring to it as like a CEO meeting. And you're really just meeting with yourself. Mm -hmm. I like that too. (laughs) I like it too. And then where do you go from there? Because I think that, you know, having a day to yourself and, and writing this all down is all fine and dandy. But then what kind of things do you put in place to move forward to ensure that you follow up with yourself? Mm hmm. So I will say, I'll give you a few more examples of what to do during the retreat. Yeah. 
So I think it's really important, even if you just go to another room in the house, to get away from wherever you normally work. So if you normally work at a desk in an office, go to a different space. You really just need a different headspace. It's like companies go on corporate retreats. They leave the building, you know, often. That's better just for your brain to kind of accept that you're doing something different. And I'll do things like rate and rank my clients. So I'll come up with my own scale of one to five and rate all of my clients on things that I want like pays on time, pays well, easy to work with, you know, fun project. Right. That's important. I think a lot of us forget that, especially as we start off that, you know, you don't just have to take everything and everyone because it doesn't work. Exactly. And I think we know intuitively over the year, like that project was really hard or that person was a pain in the butt, (laughs) but really taking the time to rate them. And then I go through and I rank all of the clients and I've used that over time. It really has solidified if someone is at the bottom of the list, you know, might've already had sort of a gut reaction that this person isn't someone I want to work with again but it really shows you in black and white, like, okay, they're at the bottom of the list and they scored really, really low. Why am I still working with them? Like it's time to cut them loose. So that's one thing. And then you can also think about big goals that you want to have in your business. I have this goal that I actually, I put on my wall and it's kind of like an elevator pitch. It's like, who do you want to be? And mine, and it can incorporate your values. So mine is basically to be a respected and go to writer and editor in the membership association industry. And I used Canva and I made a pretty sign and it hangs near my desk. And I see that all the time. And I always think when I'm taking on a new project, does that meet my goal? Is it outside the association industry? Is it outside of writing and editing? And if it is, why am I doing it? Is it going to fulfill another need. Maybe it's just a really great project or maybe they're paying me a lot of money or maybe I'm going to learn a new skill. But if it's not, I shouldn't just take that project because they offered it to me. So there's a lot of things like that to really kind of think through. um, I really like that. Yeah. I like having a sign because I just have (laughs) post-its. Yes. Well, I am a huge fan of post-its, but (laughs) the sign is really helpful because it is, it's been there for, it's the same goal I've had for a couple of years, but I do really see it and think about it as I'm considering new projects because I have a tendency to get really excited about a new project and think, of course I want to do this. And then I have to really step back and think, okay, wait a minute, why am I taking this on? Are they going to pay me enough? What am I, is it something I actually want to do? Same. It's absolutely the same. And I think it's really hard sometimes to figure out, is this someone I want to work with until, Mm -hmm. you know, a month in and you've got a three month or a six month contract and you're going, um, I could rethink this, but (laughs) now I'm kind of stuck, but it's just a couple more months. So it's okay. (laughs) Right. Right. And it's good to reflect on that and make sure that you learn from those lessons, right? I'm really a big believer in trusting your gut. Yes. So a couple other things that I do is you can look at the failures and successes over the past year and really analyze them. And you can look at where you got most of your work. Was it through LinkedIn or was it through referrals? And figure out where your clients came from and double down on that. You can also do an income audit. I do that more at the end of the year, but really figuring out what percentage of my income is coming from a certain type of work, certain clients, Again, where did that work come from? I get my audit from last year and also 2019 shows that the majority of my work comes from direct referrals. So that's what I need to focus on is continuing to build those relationships and get those referrals. Same for me. And I think there was something on Twitter that Michelle had tweeted the other day about referrals and how so many of us get our work from referrals. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've operated too. I really haven't I have never placed an ad for anything and it's great, you know, that you can continue this way. But at the same time, you kind of go, okay, your income fluctuates. So is that something that you also look at when you're doing these income audits of what's fluctuating? How do I fix that? How do I make it more long term? Yeah, I really try to have anchor clients and I use the term anchor clients and not retainer because I think when we think retainer, we think often a monthly retainer for a set number of hours. And I don't always do that. As a managing editor of magazines, I have anchor clients where I do their magazine, but it's not every month. It might be every other month or quarterly and I get paid per the magazine issue. So it's not a monthly retainer. 
But anchor clients are those projects that you know you basically have a contract with for indefinitely or a year or you know that that income is, you know, (laughs) except when a pandemic hits, (laughs) you know that that income is consistent and you can count on that. And so you can say, I know that every month here on out or every other month I'm going to get this $3,000 from this one client. And so you can really that gets rid of kind of the hustle to have more anchor clients or it gives you the ability to say, okay, I have this much money. I only need to make up this much more to pay my bills. And I can do that through other types of consistent work that might not be a kind of a contract, but I know that, you know, for writers, I might know this editor tends to use me every couple of months. So I make sure that I reach out to them every couple of months to see if they have a new project for me. So the more consistent you can be and the more anchor clients you can have, the more it just takes away kind of the stress of the hustle and the feast or famine cycle. I like that. I haven't heard the term anchor clients. Mm, okay. So that's a new one for me. I like that because I yeah. have retainer clients. That's really, mm-hmm. you know, what I have for what I do. And some of them are retainer clients that just keep coming back. <laughs> so they are my right. anchor clients in essence, which is great. Exactly. So how do you get rid of the distractions? Because if we're at home, I mean, I've got two little ones. I've got a husband. And as much as I would like to say they respect my work time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) When you're at home, it's just not, you know, the same. Is that when you'd say, you know what, go find yourself a hotel, go to the library, go do something else? Yeah. I, you know, it's harder right now. Many of us are still in lockdown and we don't have as many options right now, but Mm -hmm. definitely there are options if you have a little bit of extra cash, maybe depending on your comfort level right now, you could go do an Airbnb for a day. You can go once libraries open back up. Libraries are really great. I love libraries and it's a really great quiet place. And then you can go to a local coffee shop you know, just kind of getting out of the house. You can go to your backyard. But, you know, I think if I don't have children, but I think for those who do or have noisy roommates or noisy spouses, you know, it's kind of like anything else when you're trying to work on a client project that you really need to focus on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of the same thing. So whatever you do then, whether it's like, okay, guys, I really just need this two hours and I'll talk to you at this time, (laughs) you know, but I really need to work on this. So it's kind of the same thing. That also might limit where you can go in your house. You know, maybe they know not to bother you in the office, but if you move to a different room, it's all up in the air from there. So yeah, I would really encourage people to, if they have those kind of distractions in their house, once it's a little safer to go out, to go to a different location. I always found when I was in the corporate world and had to travel that I got so much more work done in a hotel room than I did anywhere else. Yeah. There's just no distractions. That's right. (laughs) I do really well in airplanes because you don't even have have internet really unless you pay for very slow internet, which I've never done. And I just kind of love that window seat where I kind of stick to myself over here in the little corner and work the whole time. Yeah, I know. Man, I miss flying. I miss libraries. (laughs) I miss coffee shops. You're killing me today. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. This will all come back. So let's plan for the future now. But yeah, I know. I hear you. Yeah. And even, you know, if you have all of those distractions, you could take a weekend day. That's what I've been talking about with my husband is I just need like a Saturday morning because then he's not working and he can play with the kids and I can go lock myself somewhere else. Yeah, that's a great idea. And again, as things open up, he can take the kids away somewhere, you know, and they can have their own time. Kick them out of the house. Right. right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I like this. So have you seen direct kind of results since you've been doing this within your business? Yeah, I think it just really shows me what I like to do, what boundaries I need to put sometimes on myself. Um, It's taught me what type of projects I don't like to do and how I should say no to projects when they come along because remember that that one didn't pay very well or I didn't really like that one and I had analyzed the problems with it and this seems like a similar kind of problem. And it's also taught me, like I said, where my work comes from, the referrals, and it's taught me... I've started also doing time tracking with it. So it's teaching me how much I'm actually making on projects and how much time I'm really spending on things. Oh, that's a good idea. (laughs) So just a lot. Yeah, there's just a lot of analysis that's really 
because I always say, well, two things. I never want to be an employee ever again. <laughs> I don't want to do it. If, I mean, we had a pandemic and I'm still not an employee. So I figure it's never going to happen unless something horrible beyond a pandemic happens. <laughs> and I don't know what worse I know. I Don't say like, that though. Don't right, say that. <laughs> Knock on wood. And then I always say, I want to work. I want to make as much money as I can in as few as fewest hours as I can. And, you know, everybody's level of success is different. It doesn't have to be based on income. Your success might be, all right, I want to figure out how to work 20 hours a week. I want to figure out how to never work evenings and weekends. I want to figure out how to make, you know, maybe my goal is six figures. So it really just has allowed me to really hone in on what I want, what I'm good at, where my good clients come from, where my good work comes from, where the best paying clients come from. It's really, like I said, just an analyzing so many aspects of my business and improving on the areas where I might struggle. Like I said, to say no to certain things, or you, if you know, like I mentioned earlier, imposter syndrome, if you have imposter syndrome, maybe that's, you start to realize that as you're analyzing your business and you think, all right, I need to, maybe I need to see a therapist. Maybe I need to figure out how to get over this imposter syndrome because that's holding my business back. That's great. Do you have a team or any assistants that work with you? I don't right now. I used to have a virtual assistant and she was amazing. So she lived in Europe and she got pregnant and they have very long maternity leaves. <laughs> and so she basically quit on me. And this was, I don't um, I think it was about six months before the pandemic. And so I was really reevaluating, oh, okay, so if I get a new VA, what would I have them do? How could I change that? And then the pandemic hit and I was like, no, I'm going to hang on to my money for a little bit. I do things, I do hire as a writer, I like to record interviews, but I hate to transcribe them. So I do hire transcriptionists and I try to hire individuals as opposed to a company to help out other freelancers. Mm -hmm. And so I do hire transcriptionists. I think that's the main thing, but I am definitely in favor of virtual assistants. They can help you do a lot of things. And if you get a virtual assistant that's a little more than assistant, like mine was, she knew social media strategy. So I had her do a lot of social media marketing for me. If you have an assistant, would you bring her on to some sort of a retreat type of day or would you give her any of this info if it affected her and her job or her role with you? Would you bring any of that you know, along with her? Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it that way, but I have heard of other people doing that in their business where they have someone that is more involved or they want them to become more involved. And so maybe they bring them along or right now you could do a, a Zoom retreat together or maybe you bring them in for just one part of it. Maybe you mm -hmm. brainstorm some things and then you bring them in to think about these things as well. So I think that could definitely help depending on how your business is set up. I love this. I want to have one this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Kick that family out of the house. And <laughs> tell them to go Sorry somewhere. that it's raining and parks and playgrounds are closed, but get out of here. <laughs> right. Figure something out. <laughs> I love it. So you do this quarterly now? Yeah, I don't. I'm pretty good about it. So I don't actually have it on my calendar ahead of time um, because I like it. So every few months I'll think I need to do a retreat, but I really encourage people to put it on the calendar. Even if right now you just do it for twice a year, put it on the calendar. The end of the year is a good time to do it, but you can certainly do it at other times too. And it doesn't have to be a full day. It sounds like, like you could start off with a couple hours, a few right. hours just to kind of get used to it. Yeah, I block off the whole day, but I am a morning person and I wane after lunch. And so I usually will start and go from like eight to noon and then treat myself to lunch somewhere. And then in the afternoon, maybe just do take the things that I thought about in the morning and start plugging in like, okay, I need to put this on my calendar. I need a little to-do list. These are the things I've thought about doing and I need to create my to-do list and put some things on the calendar and commit to them. But for me, I don't do a lot of that sort of brainstorming in the afternoon. Oh, this is great stuff. I love it. Can you share, Melanie, with everyone where they can find you and how they can listen to your podcast? Sure. So I'm at meledits.com and you can find me at meledits on Twitter. I'm always on Twitter. Yes. And my <laughs> podcast is at that website too, but you can also find my podcast at deliberatefreelancer.com and just search for Deliberate Freelancer and all the podcast apps. It's everywhere. 
Thank you so much. And I'm going to let you know when I do my solo business retreat and I want everyone else to to tweet us too, to let us know that they've done theirs. <laughs> yes, please let me know on Twitter. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. You can DM me or follow me on Twitter. I'm Like I said, I'm always on Twitter. So, <laughs> And please listen to the podcast. It's all about the business side of freelancing. And I talk a lot about these issues on the podcast. I do. And then I also have guests come on. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. This was great. All right, everyone. Are you ready to plan your solo business retreat? I love how easy Mel made it for us to plan this time and to hold ourselves accountable. As the CEOs of our companies, we need to have this dedicated time to look at our goals, create plans, and check in with ourselves. It's on my list to plan one as we're almost heading into Q2 of this year and to lay the foundation and groundwork for what I want my business to go and grow. I want to hear about your solo business retreats and what you're accomplishing. So please keep me posted on what you're doing. I'm cheering you on wherever you are. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and spend some time with your badass self this week. 